Um, right up the back. Right up the back of the restaurant. Okay, perfect. Uh, we're going to run. Good. Good. Perfect. We're going to run for about another hour uh, because this is going all on video and we'd like to make them uh, one hour units. Uh, so we'll finish at uh, what is okay, about quarter to one. And, and then we'll break for lunch and uh, go out next door. We are currently on page 13 of the handout. And this is handout session 9 for those of you that are on video. <coughs> we are going to talk a little bit about the founding documents. Um, those of us who went to school a long time ago probably had a little bit of this. Anybody that's gone to school recently, as far as I know, Government schools no longer teach American history. We don't want you to know your rights. You might be able to defend them. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you kind of a crash course in, you know, American history. We said that people migrated from England, came to the North American continent. They started setting up all of their, you know, the houses and businesses here. They were English. Just like if we Americans moved up to Canada, we'd be living in Canada, but we'd still be Americans. You're just living someplace else. So they were under English rule, and they were proud to be English. Eventually, the king started you know, laying and collecting taxes. Why was the king registering all these taxes? Because the England was at war. Who was England at war with? Anybody remember? France. France and Spain. Spain. So the, the king is in England and he's fighting France and Spain. And he's got, you know, got to raise money for his army. So he's like, wow, I got all this land that I own in North America. I'll just lay taxes on the people over there. Well, we were paying all these taxes for what? Hospitals, roads, you know, national defense? No. You know, we were just paying it to the king, and he was spending it for whatever he wanted. He was the king. So we got sick and tired of taxation without representation. You're taking our money, and we don't have any say-so over what we're doing with it. We wrote, eventually we wrote, the Declaration of Independence. And we severed all of our ties with England. We say, we are not going to be English anymore. We no longer have any allegiance to the crown. The Declaration of Independence was not the start of the fighting. The fighting had been going on prior to that. In fact, in 1775, the British soldiers came to Lexington and Concord to take all of our guns. Why? Well, gosh, you can't resist if you've got guns. That's why we want to collect them all. What did the Americans do? We went, no, no you won't either. These are our guns. And we ended up firing the shot heard around the world. So a year later, 1776, we formalized the war. The Declaration of Independence was the formal start of the Revolutionary War. Now, what was the end of the Revolutionary War. If the Declaration of Independence started it, what was the official end? The official end of the war was the Treaty of Paris. Wait a minute, we were we fighting with England? Why is it the Treaty of Paris? Why wasn't it the Treaty of London? Because you want neutral territory. Some place that's not yours and it's not mine. We're going to go to a neutral territory. We're going to go to Paris. And we're going to sign the Treaty of Paris. Now, I've got a copy of the Treaty of Paris in here. And this book is really excellent because it shows you everything in type that you can read. It also has a photograph. It also has a photograph of the actual document so that you can see what the document looked like. Now I purchased this book from the National Archive in Washington DC. Guess what the title of this is? 
the cornerstones of American democracy. Are we a democracy? No. No, we're not. We don't like a democracy. This is from the National Archive. Well, if you're going to Washington, D.C. and buying official books with the Declaration of Independence, and it's called the you know, cornerstones of democracy, why do you think people think we live in a democracy? They are lying to us all the time. Now, the book is very, very good. I just don't happen to like the title. Now, if I get married, and then several years later, I decide to split up, we're going to have to do something. We have to have a divorce settlement. You get the kids, I get the dog, you get the house, I get the car. We've got to split up the property. Again, everything derives from property. The Treaty of Paris, if you sit and read it, is a divorce settlement. We are getting divorced from England. We're no longer part of England. And so we're splitting up the property. What did the United States get? Property. A lodial title. It no longer belongs to the king. It's yours. You can own property for the first time in human history. Ta-da! Isn't that great? That's why the Treaty of Paris is so important. Now, we got the property. We are now allodial landholders. What did England get? What did we give England in this settlement? Well, if you ever, ha if you ever have a divorce and there are children involved, usually there are custody rights. The kids are going to live with me, but you get to come and visit them every so often. Well, England basically got visitation rights. They get to come here and sell all their products. Because we had two million people in the United States. Those are customers. England didn't want to lose customers. So we're going to give you the land as long as we can still buy and sell over in America. And we basically gave them the, uh, the privilege of traveling up and down the Mississippi River. So that's what England got out of the uh, Treaty of Paris. So, now, during that time, you know, while they were fighting the uh, uh, Revolutionary War, did we have the Constitution? No. What did we have as our form of government at the time? The Articles of Confederation. So the Articles of Confederation basically set up a loosely organized group. Thirteen independent colonies that kind of joined together like a club. In fact, the title, the title of the Declaration of Independence is really the Unanimous Declaration of the Thirteen United States of America. And united is a small u. It's not an uppercase U. It's not United States. They are states. They just happen to be united. United is an adjective. And this is a unanimous declaration. Anybody have a unanimous declaration all by yourself? I mean, it's a contradiction, isn't it? If something is unanimous, that means everybody in the group agrees. So if this is the unanimous declaration of independence, it means there had to be a group. Yeah. 13 states, 13 colonies, they all agreed, and they joined a collective organization which was a confederacy. And the Articles of Confederation were really like the first constitution. Now, we did not win the American Revolution. We were not really strong and tough and just kicked butt. Didn't happen. George Washington won two battles out of all of it. He was constantly running away. He was retreating. You go know, bang, 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 and they pick up his guys and go. And the British are going, wait a minute, what are you guys doing? Stand still so we can shoot you. How are you supposed to have a battle if you keep running away? That's ridiculous. Bang, 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 and run away, run away. So we only won two battles. We didn't win. We just refuse to lose. King George is fighting 
France and Spain. He's got his hands full over here. And he's looking over his shoulder going, oh man, you guys are a pain in the butt. You want to be free? Go. Be free. Be independent. You're more trouble than you're worth. We didn't win. So how did we win? Just all by yourself? No. Somebody was loaning us money. Who do you think would loan us money? Hmm. You think maybe France and Spain? <laughs> Wait a minute. You hate the king too? Here, here's money. Go buy guns. You can help us fight the king. There'll be three of us now instead of just two. So, so France and Spain loaned us all this money. The end of the American Revolution. Okay, Treaty of Paris. Fighting is over. Wait a minute. Do you think that France and Spain want their money back? How many people except mom and dad are going to loan us money and not ask for the money back? So France and Spain, you know, it's like, come on guys, pay up. So according to the Articles of Confederation, the, uh, you know, Washington could ask, couldn't demand, and everybody's supposed to pay their fair share. And Virginia went, you know, we'll catch you next month. You know, we're busy growing tobacco right now. We're trying to build up Virginia. And nobody was putting in their fair share. And if they did, they were printing money. Each one of the colonies was an independent country. Like France and Spain, we had Virginia, Massachusetts, Connecticut. And they printed their own money. And they were printing it like it was going out of style. Pretty soon, people would not take money. I said, here, I'll give you a dollar. You go, I don't want a dollar. Why not? Because next week it's going to be worth 50 cents. It's losing money. I'll take something useful. Give me chickens. Give me silver. Give me gold. But I'm not going to take that paper money. If people will not take money, what happens to the economy? It stops. And if the economy stops, everybody's in trouble. And so they went, wait a minute, wait a minute. You guys got to go back to Philadelphia and you've got to fix the Articles of Confederation. Add a paragraph, delete a sentence, edit, you know, patch it up, make it work. So they go all rushing off to Philadelphia. Did they modify the Articles of Confederation? No. They scrapped it. They started from scratch. And they came up with the Constitution. Yay! But, you know, these guys were the founding fathers, and they all just agreed. They just kind of sat around with their arms around each other, and there was just unanimous approval for the Constitution, right? No. 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 They almost got into fisticuffs. Sure, uh, Benjamin Franklin several times had to stop them from fighting. That's how much they were arguing. Now, who were the two groups? You had, first of all, Alexander Hamilton and all of his boys. Did you know that Alexander Hamilton was a monarchist? Mm -hmm. He did not like King George, but he liked the idea of a king. In fact, he liked it so much, he wanted to take the English system of government and bring it here. We're going to have our own House of Commons, our own House of Lords. We're going to have our own Parliament. And Alexander Hamilton actually asked George Washington if George Washington would be the first king. Fortunately for us, King, uh, king, <laughs> king Washington. George Washington said no. Luckily, now, they went into uh, Philadelphia and Alexander Hamilton and his boys, they came in with a whole new document. And they said, well, I think we can get this one passed. Now, what? Uh, there are two forms of government. On page 13, we look at the definition of federal. Federal is of or pertaining to a compact or league, especially a league between nations or states. It's a club. Now, let's look at national. Of, pertaining to, or maintained by a nation as an organized whole or independent unit. So a national government is one. A federal government is many. 
If we talk about the United States, we are talking about a national government. At the early stages of our country, we talked about these United States. These meaning plural. We don't use that anymore. Why not? So you've got a federal government versus a national government. Now, Alexander Hamilton wanted a national government. He wanted a strong central government. And he wrote the Constitution, or helped write the Constitution, to establish a strong central government. Do you think the people would have voted for that? No. We just had a war against King George. We just got rid of a strong central government. Why would I want another one? So Alexander Hamilton knew that people would never vote for a national government. So he called himself and his group the Federalists. Isn't that great? That's like dog and cat. So he just named his group the Federalists. But he was really a nationalist. Now, Thomas Jefferson and all of his boys wanted a loosely organized government or a federal government. Thomas Jefferson was a federalist. Well, wait a minute, you can't use that name because Alexander Hamilton's already got that name. So Alexander Hamilton jumped in. He said, okay, you guys can be the anti-federalists. If you're an anti-federalist, does it sound like you're in favor of a loosely organized group or against it? So before the Constitution was even written, our politicians were already lying to us. <clears throat> now, if you go to... Now, Alexander Hamilton, James uh, Madison, and John Jay wrote newspaper articles. They were basically editorials, trying to convince people to ratify the Constitution. Because we think it's such a great idea. Those newspaper articles are collected together and called the Federalist Papers. That was one of the things that we used to have to read in school. Now I've never even heard people, people don't even know what they are. There's another book known as the Anti-Federalist Papers. Those were written by Patrick Henry and the guys that are against the Constitution. It's a lesser known book. You should really read both of them. People say, well, we don't know what the Founding Fathers were really thinking. Baloney! We know exactly what they were thinking. They wrote it down. You just have to read it. The politicians say, no, we don't know what they were thinking. We, we have no idea what they said. So you'll just have to take our word for it. Okay. So let's read a little bit what they said. Alexander Hamilton wrote in Federalist Paper Number 9, the definition of a Confederate Republic seems simply to be an assemblage of societies or an association of two or more states into one state. The extent, modifications, and objects of the federal authority are mere matters of discretion. Hey, don't worry your pretty little head about it. Right? Uh, so long as the separate organizations of the members be not abolished, so long as it exists by a constitutional necessity for local purposes, though it should be in perfect subordination to the general authority of the Union, it would still be, in fact and in theory, an association of states, or a confederacy. This fully corresponds in every rational import of the term with the idea of a federal government. So he's twisting the words around and saying, no, 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 it's really a federal government because we didn't erase all the lines. Patrick Henry wrote in 1788, the fate of this question and America may depend on this. Have they said, we the states? Have they made a proposal of a compact between states? If they had, this would be a confederation. It is otherwise most clearly a consolidated government. The question turns, sir, on that poor little thing. The expression, we the people, instead of states of America. 
I need not take much pains to show that the principles of this system are extremely pernicious, impolitic, and dangerous. The rights of conscience, trial by jury, liberty of the press, all of your immunities and franchises, all the pretensions to human rights and privileges are rendered insecure, if not lost, by this change so loudly talked about by some and inconsiderately by others. Is this same relinquishment of rights worthy of free men? Is it worthy that, uh, of that manly fortitude that ought to characterize Republicans? It is said eight states have adopted this plan. I declare that if 12 states and a half had adopted it, I would, with manly firmness, and in spite of an erring world, reject it. So Patrick Henry says, you're all wrong. It is not a federal government. It is a national government, and I don't care how many people say that 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, it's not. So there were people at the time who were opposed to the Constitution because they were afraid that it gave too much power to the government. We've got 225 years of hindsight. Who was right? <laughs> now, the Constitution was written as a response to all this printed money. When you print money, you cause inflation. When you cause inflation, people will not accept the currency. If people do not accept the currency, the economy stops. And if the economy stops, everybody is hurt. And so they said, go to Washington and create something, you know, fix the Articles of Confederation. They didn't. They replaced it. Started from scratch with the Constitution. It was signed on September 17th, 1787, all right? We're very, very close to September 17th, Constitution Day. What are you doing for Constitution Day to, you know, celebrate that document, right? Or possibly to announce how bad that document is. The Constitution is a wonderful document but it has some terrible flaws in it. If you don't read the document, you don't know what the flaws are. Now, the Constitution had to go out and had to be ratified. Why? Because they didn't have authorization to do that. They had to get permission from the people. And so, um, the states, the 13 colonies, had to ratify it. How many colonies had to ratify it before it became the supreme law of the land. Nine. The Articles of Confederation said it had to be unanimous. Do you think they would have been able to be unanimous? No. So Alexander Hamilton said, we've got to get away with less. We'll, we'll do it for nine. And then just kind of force everybody into it. Now eventually, all 13 states did ratify it. But only nine were required. Now, when we ratified the Constitution, that was two years later, in 1789. 1789 was the same year that we wrote the Bill of Rights. Well, why did we write a Bill of Rights? Wasn't the Constitution good enough? No. They were afraid that the Constitution gave too many powers to the federal government. We wanted protection from the government. We wanted a Bill of Rights. We wanted further limitations on the government. All right. So the, the Bill of Rights was written in 1789 and ratified two years later in 1791. So everybody remembers 1776. Add 11 and you've got 1789, uh, which was the uh, uh, 87. 1787 is when the Constitution was signed. Two years later, in 89, it was ratified. 
and the Bill of Rights was written, and the Bill of Rights was ratified two years after that in 1791. Right? So 11, 2, and 2. Now, let's talk about the Constitution, finally. If you open up your book on the Constitution to page 17, we have the preamble. What is a preamble? It's a paragraph that says why we are writing this document. It's a statement of purpose. Most of you should know this by heart. It says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Okay? That's why we are writing the Constitution. So, to uh, to form a more perfect union. That means they already had a union. The Articles of Confederation. But we said that one doesn't work so well, so we are going to form a more perfect union. Right? For these reasons. And then it says we're going to, uh, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Does that mean for everybody? No, that's how we should interpret it, but that's not what they meant. And also notice that the first line says, we the people of the United States. And the last line says, uh, establish this Constitution for the United States of America. United States and United States of America. Those are two different things. One is a republic, the other is a democracy. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, the Constitution was set up to operate as a negative authority. Who has all the power? We do. We are giving power and authority to the government. That is a permission. We have the rights, they get privileges. Don't let them tell you anything different. Now, the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of each state are a political trust. Let me describe a trust very briefly. Let us pretend that I am very old. Let us also pretend that I am very rich. You're going to have to pretend on the rich part a lot harder than you have to pretend on the other part. Okay? So I'm rich and old and I have children. And I want to leave my money, all my millions of dollars for my children. But they're children. They don't know how to spend money. If I give them $10 million, they're going to spend it on bubble gum. You know? And I don't want that to happen. So knowing that I'm probably going to die before they grow up, I want to create a contract. I'm going to create a contract with John. This is Uncle John. And I want to leave my money for my children. So I write a contract with John that says, I'm going to give you my money. And when my children turn 18 or 21 or whatever age I decide, I want you to give them their money. And I will pay you $1,000 a year or whatever it is to do that. So I've got a contract with John. That is known as a trust. I am the trust or. The reason I write this contract is because I trust John. I don't think he's going to, you know, take advantage of me. Because I'm not going to be here to, to make sure. John is the trustee. He's the person that I'm putting my trust in. Now, who does the money belong to? John? No. The money belongs to my children, the beneficiaries of the trust. Do they have to do anything to get that money? Well, no, probably not. Just grow up. You know, if I've got a son that's a real bum, maybe I'll say that he's got to get married before he gets the money. But I can write that into the contract. 
And so if my son turns 21 and he's not married, can John give my son the money? No, that would be a breach of contract. John has a fiduciary responsibility to execute that contract as I, as I wrote it. The Constitution is a political trust. Who wrote the trust? The Founding Fathers. What did they want to give us? Money? No. Liberty and security. They fought for it, they had it, and they wanted to make sure they transfer it to their posterity. So what did they do? They wrote up a trust, a contract with a group of people who are the trustees. Who are the trustees of this contract? Government. Anybody who goes into office. Why do they take an oath of office to solemnly swear to uphold and defend the Constitution? So that if they violate that contract, they are guilty of perjury and treason. Perjury is punishable by imprisonment. Treason is punishable by life in prison or death. This is not small potatoes. This is serious stuff. So the Constitution is a political trust, and everybody who goes into office takes an oath of office, and they have a fiduciary responsibility to protect your rights. It's not just a good idea. It's a contractual obligation. So, we want to put limits on that power. Now, one of the things that the Founding Fathers did was to establish a system of checks and balances. How many people remember that? Good. Now, what are the system of checks and balances? Lock and key? Well, it's kind of, sort of. There were three branches of government. You had the legislative branch that makes the law, the executive branch that enforces the law, and the judicial branch that uh, adjudicates breaches of the law. But it's all law. And we want to make sure that each group doesn't have too much power. So we separate them. <coughs> Ironically, the first three articles of the Constitution are legislative, executive, and judicial. You want to know anything about Congress, go to Article 1. You want to know anything about the President and Vice President, go to Article 2. Supreme Court, that's Article 3. Let's talk about Article 1, which is legislative. Uh, go, to, I should, go to page 17. It says, all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress consisting of a Senate and House of Representatives. Why do we have a Senate and a House of Representatives? Why didn't we just have, like, one big room? That would, you know, if you're going to argue, at least you're there in the same room together. There was a fight between the states. The little ones felt like they wouldn't be representatives, so they got two senators. They would be equal, but representatives... Good. So we're, we're trying to argue about this Constitution. And you've got big states like New York and Virginia have lots and lots of people. You've also got little tiny states like New Jersey and um, Rhode Island. And they're saying, well, okay, we're going to vote. The big states are saying, we're going to vote by population. The more people you get, the more votes you get. The small states are going, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not fair. You guys have got way more people than we do, so if we decide to do that, then we're never going to get a vote, or we're only going to get so many votes it's not going to count. You know, we're never going to have any say-so. So each state should have its own vote. One state, one vote. And the big states are going, whoa, 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 that's not fair. You guys have only got, you know, 20 people. So if you guys vote, then everybody in Virginia is supposed to go the way that uh, in Virginia or New Jersey goes? That doesn't sound fair. This was the biggest argument in the entire thing, is how they were going to vote. It ended up being the great compromise. You're not going to do it that way. We're not going to do it this way. We're going to do it both ways.
The House of Representatives currently has 435 members. The number of representatives that you have depends on how many people you have. That makes the big states happy. The Senate was originally going to have one. They decided to have two just in case somebody got sick. Every state gets two senators. That way, whether you're New Jersey or Texas, you still get two. Everybody's got the same vote. So you make the small states happy, and you do it both ways. Now, we can go through, what I'd like you to do is uh, go to page 18, and we're going to look at uh, section 2, clause uh, 3, which says, uh, shall be determined by adding the uh, whole number of persons the actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of Congress and within every subsequent term of ten years. What are we talking about? The census. Why do they take the census? They have to. It's in the Constitution. Why do they take a census? Why do we go out and count noses? For representatives. To find out how many representatives you've got. What happened to Texas in the last census. We added two representatives. That's because Texas is so wonderful, everybody's moving here. You go, wow, you guys got a lot more people. We're going to have to give you two more representatives. What does that mean about somebody else? They lost two somewhere along the line. So the census is mandatory. They have to count and find out how many people. Can they ask you how much money you make, whether you're living with somebody, how many children you have? No. Well, they can, but you don't have to answer. Oh, that's good. Good response. They can ask, you know, but they don't, you don't have to tell them. I got, unfortunately, the small form. I was, I was hoping to get the big form. So there would be more answers that I refused to answer. More, more questions that I refused to answer. But they're supposed to take the census for representatives and taxation. Direct taxes are supposed to be apportioned to the several states. Direct taxes are uh, taxes that you cannot avoid. Indirect taxes are taxes that you can avoid, like a sales tax. They got a tax on gasoline, and you don't want to pay the tax. What do you do? Don't buy gas. Don't buy gas. But if it's a direct tax, you can't avoid it. They basically come and collect it. Well, a direct tax cannot go directly to the people. It is apportioned to the several states. Congress has to write a bill, say, well, we need a million dollars for whatever. Now, if they need a million dollars, Washington, D.C. should send a bill to Sacramento, California for their share. Sac uh, California has 10% of the people in the United States. One out of every ten people in the United States lives in California. So Washington, D.C. should send Sacramento a bill for $100,000, or 10% of the bill. If Sacramento's got the money, they should write a check, and the people of California never know. If they don't, well, then they can send out a, uh, you know, tax everybody 25% or 25 cents for your fair share. But once that tax is collected, it's over. End of story. Now, please go to page 20, and we want to look at Article 1, Section 4-2. The sections are labeled in your book. The clauses <coughs> are not. So when you get to a clause, you just have to count paragraphs. So. This is the, uh, right underneath section four, the second paragraph. It says, Congress shall assemble at least once in every year. Why do they write that? How long is Congress in session right now? All year long. All year long. I mean, you know, 11 and a half months a year. They take two weeks in December to go to the Bahamas with their secretary. So why is Congress in session so long? Or rather, why did the, uh, the Founding Fathers feel a necessity to write, you must get together once a year? What difference does it make? They're there all the time. 
Well, maybe they didn't expect Congress to be there all year long. What is Congress supposed to do? Where is that listed? It's listed in Section 8. Let's go to uh, page 23. In the middle of the page in your book, little booklet, con uh, Constitution booklet, says Section 8. Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises every April 15th for anything they want. <laughs> Isn't that what your book says? I have a different copy? What does your book say? To lay and collect duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts, provide for the common defense, and general welfare. End of story. If they are collecting taxes for anything other than that, it's unconstitutional. They can't do that. Now, Section 8 gives a list of 18 things that Congress is permitted to do. It's a privilege that we give them. Let's look at some of them. They can borrow money. They can regulate commerce with foreign nations. Establish a uniform rule of naturalization. Coin money and regulate the value thereof. Provide for the punishment of counterfeiting. Establish post offices. Uh, promote the progress of science. Uh, constitute tribunals to define and punish pi piracies. Declare war. Raise and support armies to provide and maintain a navy, etc., etc. Eighteen things. Those are the things that Congress is given permission to do. Anything that Congress is doing that is not in that list is, by definition, unconstitutional. Take a quick check. Show me Board of Education. Can you find it? Show me Social Security. Is it in there? They're unconstitutional. You can't do that. Now, they can... Build an army. They can build a navy. Okay, bang. You got soldiers, you got sailors. No air force. Okay. Well, there wasn't an air force at the time. When they, when they say, and general welfare of the United States, yeah, is that where they come back and say, here's education, okay. here's my... Where, what is general welfare? General welfare means that it's got to be good for everybody. For the like general the population. That's the things that they specify. Mm -hmm. Like the patent office and the trademark <clears throat> office. Uh, those, those are the items of general welfare. They were, they That's were right. Specifically. Now, um, handouts for food stamps or free housing and all that, is that general welfare? No. Not unless everybody gets it. That is not general welfare. That is specific welfare. And that's where they've twisted these words around. About public education. I'm, I'm opposed to public education. I'm in favor of everybody being really smart. But in 1953, we established the uh, Department of Housing, Education, and Welfare. During the 1950s, students in the United States were number one in math and science. Russia was a distant number two. We were so far in first place that we didn't even have to worry about it. Everybody was sending their boys and girls to the United States to get a good education. So now we've had the Department of Education for about 50 years. Can your kids read and write? If they can, it's not because they went to school. Currently, United States students are 21 on a, on a nationwide or worldwide scale. We are no longer in first place. In fact, we are so far from first place, we can't even count that high. So, back to my definition of uh, insanity. We've had the de uh, Department of Education for 50 years. You want to throw more money into it? No, let's eliminate the Department of Education. Let's start teaching our kids something. Homeschool them. They have a... Uh, national Spelling Bee every year. The last four years in a row, the winner of the National Spelling Bee was homeschooled. 
The last year, the first, second, and third place students were homeschooled. You have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. Your kids are going to school and coming back stupid. Take them out of school so they learn something. <laughs> Congress is supposed to, prevent, to create an army. They did. They're supposed to create a navy. They did. What are they going to do next year? Well, you don't have to create an army. You've already got one. You don't have to create a navy again, so you can cross those two off the list. You're supposed to create post offices. Well, okay, we did. Maybe this year we got one more. Okay, we've got it. Now what? Well, there's not much else they're supposed to do. Go home! That's why the Founding Fathers put in that article about you've got to get together at least once a year. How often do we elect our representatives? Every other year. The Founding Fathers were paranoid that we were going to go to Washington, get elected, have a big celebration, and then go home and never come back. They don't want the ship of state traveling without somebody checking in, and so they say you've got to check in at least once a year. That all by itself gives you a strong clue that Congress is doing more than they're supposed to. Go home! Article or uh, Section 9 of Article 1 is a list of things that Congress can't do. Now, wait a minute. If we are giving you permission, and I've given you a list of the things that you can't do, anything that's not on that list, you can't do, right? And just, you know, you tell your kids, these are the things you can eat. You know, grapefruit, cauliflower, you know, spinach. Anything that's not on that list, you can't eat. How about M&M's? Is it on the list? No. Then you can't do it. But as a parent, you know that a list of things you can do isn't enough. If you're going to go off to the store, you can say, these are the things you can't eat, and these are the things you can't eat. You can't have M&M's. You can't have Hershey bars. You can't have candy of any form just in case you didn't know from the first list. So we gave Congress, just in case you didn't know, a second list. Section 9 says these are the things you cannot do. Let me look at uh, 9. Uh, number uh, on page 25, 9-4. No capitation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or enumeration hearing before directed to be taken. So we're giving Congress power to tax. We already said that it was supposed to be enumerated, but we're going to go in and say, and you can't do any tax that's not based on enumeration. You can't. Are they doing it? Yeah. It's unconstitutional. Who's going to do something about it? Congress? No. It's our job. We've got to hold their feet to the fire. You can't do it if you don't know the Constitution. Section 10 of the Constitution tells the states certain things that they cannot do. Let's look at uh, uh, page 26. Section 10-1. No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation. Why? Because you're already in a confederation. You're already part of the United States. You can't be a part of their stuff, too. What would you say if your husband or wife came home and said, Sweetheart, I'm getting married. Um, time out. You can't do that. You're already in an agreement. The other thing the states cannot do is grant letters of mark and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, or make anything but gold and silver coin a tender and payment of debts. Why gold and silver? Because it has real value. You pick it up and it's worth something. It feels like something. It's heavy. Not like those tokens they give us. 
This is real money. This is lawful money. It's authorized by the Constitution. Anything other than gold or silver is unconstitutional for the states. Now, we're going to talk about money a lot more after lunch, so I'm just going to kind of leave that. But that is why I require silver for this class, because it is constitutional. It would be hypocritical for me to accept Federal Reserve notes, which are fiat, worthless paper. So, Article 1 tells you everything that you need to know about Congress. It gives them a list of things that they are allowed to do. Anything that is not listed in Article 1, Section 8 is, by definition, unconstitutional. Article 2 deals with the executive. The executive is the president of the United States and his vice president and everybody else who is enforcing law down to your local police officer. He is also, he or she is also part of the executive. Now, it says in on page 27 uh, in that third paragraph there, the electors uh, shall meet uh, this, each state shall appoint, in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct, a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. How many representatives does Texas have now? 32. How many senators do we have? Two. Two. So we've got a total of 34 members in Congress. Now, the state legislature can elect as many. So we've got 34 over here in Congress. We're going to create another 34 people. These are electors. What are they going to do? They are going to elect the president. This is your electoral college. It's not the senators and uh, representatives that are voting, but the same number. We've got 535 people in Congress and 535 different people in the Electoral College. They are the ones to get the vote. Have you ever seen them on TV? Yes, during the last election down in Florida when we had this big brouhaha, they finally showed members of the Electoral College. They had a number, like 32 people in Florida who were dropping their ballots in the box. Now, if the people get to direct to, to, to vote for the president directly, what does that make the United States? A democracy. Do you want a democracy? No. So the founding fathers set up a system to basically say these people are going to take, you know, the feel of the country or the feel of the state. Now, if you are an elector, you're supposed to say, okay, all of my group is Republican. And you're supposed to take that into account. And probably nine times out of ten, you're going to vote Republican because all the people that you represent are Republican. But what if it's 50-50? 50% Democratic, 50% Republican. Now who do you vote for? Your choice. Your choice. Now, if you get 90% Republican, can you vote Democratic? Yes. yes. It's your choice. You're supposed to do what you think is the smart thing to do. Because if the people all say, oh, yeah, let's vote for uh, that Ross Perot guy, and you don't think that's a good idea, you're protecting them from their own stupidity. That's why they elected you. What if the elector is stupid? <laughs> you elected the wrong guy. <laughs> What's that? It's based on each state. And what's that? It's, it's going to be different for each state. The state legislature determines how your electors are chosen. And one of the things on my growing list of things to do is to find out how Texas does it. I just haven't had time to get around to it. Okay. So, you know, if that system is corrupt, why are you voting for president? Why do we go out and cast our ballot? 
Does the popular vote mean anything? No. 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 Years and years ago, you have this little car seat for kids, a little plastic steering wheel, so you can sit next to Daddy and you can help drive. I help Daddy. I help Daddy. Okay. If you're going, you know, and turning right with your steering wheel, can the car go left? Yeah, because your steering wheel's not connected. <laughs> if voting for the president meant anything, it would have been illegal long ago. Now, the vice president, I'm, go to page 28. It says, um, you're going to vote for, uh, okay, but in choosing the president, the votes shall be taken by the states. Uh, where am I? Okay, right at the top of the page. So the person having the greatest number of votes shall be the president, uh, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. And if there be more than one of such a more, uh, okay. Uh, uh, where does it say the vice president? The vice president is the guy that gets the second number of votes. In every case after the choice. Okay. Three quarters of the way down that right Okay. In every case after the choice of making president, the person having the greatest number of votes of the electors shall be the vice president. Okay. Is that the way we do it? No. When did that change? Had to change somewhere. Okay. That's the Twelfth Amendment. And we'll talk about the Twelfth Amendment. Now, one last thing before we go. Page 29. Okay. Look at the last paragraph on the, page, the bottom of page 29. It says, Before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. Quote, I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Just like Lenin does. The oath of office is in the Constitution. They wrote it down. Why? It's a trust. It's a contract. And when you take that oath of office, you are swearing to defend and protect the Constitution. If you don't, it's perjury and treason. So what I want to do is I'm going to stop there. We're going to break for lunch. When we come back, we'll finish up a little bit with the, uh, the executive. All right. Thank you.